Your Bibles and join me in Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. We're continuing our series in this book as it teaches us and gives uh, to us the wisdom of God. Uh, before I come uh, to the scripture reading, I want to say a special thank you uh, to our deacons, especially, uh, who have worked very, very hard to prepare our building uh, for this morning. And so thank you, deacons, those who cleaned and set up chairs and, and all of that stuff. Thank you very much. And uh, so come with me now to Proverbs chapter 9. I'll read a section from the beginning of the chapter and the end of the chapter, but before I read, uh, let's sing this prayer as we approach God's word together. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. And then jump with me to verse 13. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of sheep. Father, help us now to receive the gift of you speaking to us through these words that are very ancient, but are very relevant, contemporary, right now to us. We ask for the work of your spirit, and we ask that we would be responsive to his work. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. When we lived in Florida, our house had a window that looked over our backyard, and that window was located over the sink in the kitchen. And so at certain times of the year, that window made the chore of washing dis dishes a little less boring and a little more exciting because hummingbirds would fly up and greet me at that window as I washed the dishes. Now, I understood that those hummingbirds weren't there for me. They were there for the nectar of the beautiful red flower that bloomed right outside of the kitchen window of our house. But when I think of hummingbirds, I think of us. I think of human nature. Because, like hummingbirds, we are creatures in motion, animated by our attractions. Like hummingbirds, we are creatures of desire. We are drawn to things that will nourish us, that attract us. 
You are not in the first place. You are not a thinking being. You are a wanting being. And in the end, you are what you want. You are what you desire. Proverbs knows this about us. And that's why the first section of this book ends in chapter 9 with two women. Remember that Proverbs, while it speaks to us all, at the literary level, it is cast as a voice to a young man. Words to a young man who is on the cusp of adulthood. And so here in chapter 9, Proverbs puts in front of the young man two women. Why? Well, because we are creatures in motion, animated by attraction. Proverbs with these two women is calling out to our desires. Proverbs doesn't just want our minds. It wants our hearts. Chapter 4 says, guard your heart, for from it flow the springs of life. Wisdom isn't just about information. And we will become wise when our desires are changed, formed by this book. And so this morning, I want to consider, consider the two women of Proverbs chapter 9 and what they have to teach us about our attractions. And so three questions about desire this morning. What, why, and how? First of all, what? What should we desire if we are to become wise? Notice that these two women are both connected to houses. And both of these houses are located at high elevation. They are located in the, in the high places of the city. And in an ancient city, what was usually placed at the highest point of the city? A temple. A house of devotion to whatever God that people worshipped. And so for the ancient people of God in the Old Testament, what was at the center of their land? It was a city called Jerusalem, also called Mount Zion, a place of high elevation. And what was at the center of that city? A temple built by Solomon, whose name is on the byline of the book of Proverbs, whose name is most closely associated with wisdom in the Old Testament. Wisdom is connected to the temple. And the point of these two houses in Proverbs chapter 9 is that the contrast between these two women, the contrast between wisdom and folly is a liturgical one. It is a contrast in worship. So woman folly here sounds a lot like another woman that we find in the pages of Proverbs. There's a woman who invites the young man out of the covenant of marriage and into an adulterous relationship. She is often called strange or foreign. Now we have to be careful with that language. That is not xenophobia. That is not a fear of other ethnicities or, or other cultures. That is a concern for worship. That is a concern about the possibility of God's people being attracted away from him towards other gods. So the most common way for the Bible to speak about idolatry is with the language of adultery. So Proverbs 9 puts these two women in front of us because it wants us to be attracted away from false gods to the worship of the true God. 
It wants our lives to be drawn into true worship. And I mean worship in the broadest possible sense. Not just what we're doing here this morning, but in the sense of all of our lives wholeheartedly, fully devoted to God and what He wants. That's what we should desire if we want to become wise. We should be attracted to God and his vision for our lives. Remember from last week, the image of wisdom as a path. Well, the direction of our path should be towards him and what he wants. Our desires should propel us in that direction. So let me ask you. What's the direction of your desires? I take walks on a regular basis. I almost said hikes, but what I do is not intense enough to be qualified as a hike. But I have noticed something as I have ambled along sidewalks and trails. I've noticed something. I've noticed that sometimes there is an official trail and there's an unofficial one as well. So uh, there's a paved path that goes one direction and then a worn dirt path that goes another often more convenient or more interesting way. And I have learned that there is a technical term for those unofficial paths. They are called desire lines because they show which way people really want to go. So if we are going to become wise, we have to examine the desire lines of our lives. We have to examine things like our budget, our money, our resources, our time, our attention, our energy, our emotions. All of those things are desire lines. They show us where we really want to go. We need to examine those paths and ask, is my life headed towards God and his vision or towards someone or something else? But with all of the options out in front of us, with all of the voices and images that call out for our desires, why would we choose this direction? Why would we choose what Proverbs wants for us? Second question, why should we choose to desire God in this way? Well, notice that these two women are not only connected to houses, they are also connected to meals. Both of these women prepare a meal. And these are not primarily meals of sustenance. They are meals of seduction. There's an inescapable romantic overtone to this chapter. These tables prepared by these two women invite intimacy. They invite relationship. They invite connection. And that's true of both of these tables, but what is different is what's on the table, what makes up the meal. Woman Folly serves a deceptive meal, stolen bread, water in secret, that initially tastes sweet, but has the aftertaste of death. In contrast, woman wisdom serves a feast, a joyful feast of transformation and life. Did you notice in verse 1 that her house, Woman Wisdom's house, it says that she builds it with seven pillars. That connects what she is doing to what God did in creation, the seven days of creation. 
And that is, a, that is a symbol that's an image saying that this place, this table, is where you taste new life. Life as it should be. But what makes wisdom's meal different from Father's? Why is her table so different? Well, remember, once again, her, her house has been connected to the temple. And in fact, the, one of the first times that we hear the word wisdom in the Bible is found in the book of Exodus. When God pours out his wisdom on two contractors, two craftsmen who've been tasked with building the tabernacle, the precursor of the temple. That place is built with wisdom. And the tabernacle and the temple, they weren't only places of praise. They were not only houses where the people worshipped God. They were also places of presence. Places where God drew near and dwelt with his people. And that's what makes wisdom's table different. That is what makes her meal transformative and life-giving. Because she has built a place of presence. She offers us the possibility of intimate communion with God. Eating and drinking with him in a way that draws life from him in the deepest possible way. Wisdom holds out to us. She calls us to a life-giving connection with our creator. That's why her view is different. And that's why her call should attract our desires. We long for communion. My family watched a musical last week. It's a pretty obscure one. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Hamilton. Um, we watched Hamilton together last week, but we not only watched the musical, we also watched the uh, extra interviews. Uh, with the, the writer and director and the performers. And, and all of them were lamenting the loss of live theater during this pandemic. And, and I think it was the director who said how, how much he missed gathering in a room and communing through a piece of art. And there is something different, isn't there, to a live performance? a deeper connection between the artist and the audience. Wisdom calls out to us and she offers us a deep connection to the divine artist. She offers us a meal of communion with the divine singer who sang all things into existence. And that's why you should listen to her. That's why her house, her table, should be our desire. But there's a problem. And the problem is Solomon, whom I've already mentioned. Because, yes, Solomon was blessed with an enormous amount of wisdom. And in his wisdom, Solomon built the temple. And he saw God's glorious presence descend on that place, and he worshipped there. He embodied all of the things that we have talked about, but that was not all that was true of him. First Kings tells us that not only had he been full of wisdom, not only had he built the temple, not only had, had he worshipped, but he also loved many foreign women. Again... Not a concern about ethnicity, but about idolatry. 
And Solomon's heart turned. His desires turned away from God. And he built high places, competing places of worship and communion with other gods. And he sowed the seeds of division and judgment for God's people. And he is evidence of what is true about us, what is true about our desires, which is that we are born with an irresistible drift, an irresistible drift away from God, away from what would bring us life. We irresistibly incline in our desires towards folly in the house of death. So knowing what and why, now we have, we have to ask how. If Solomon could not desire what he was supposed to desire, what hope is there for us? How is it possible for us to desire God in this way? And the beginning of, a, of an answer is already there in the tabernacle and the temple. Because what these buildings represented is that they represented God moving towards his people. And listen, we will never be able to stir up a desire for God in ourselves, on our own. You can't grit your teeth and grunt hard enough to create that holy longing. No, in order for us to move towards God, he must move towards us. It is his desire for us that makes possible our desire for him. And he has moved towards us. He has desired us in a way that surpasses the tower, in a way that surpasses the temple, in a way that even surpasses wisdom's house in Proverbs 9, because God has moved towards us in Jesus, who is the true temple. Jesus, who is God with us, not in a building, but in a body. And do you remember from the Gospel of John what Jesus, the true temple, what was his first public action? Well, it was to turn water into wine at a romantic meal, a wedding meal. And then throughout his life, he sat down at tables with people to commune with them. But here's the thing about the people with whom he sat down with. They weren't wise people. They weren't people who had perfected longings for God. So Jesus sat down at tables with sinners and fools like you and me. Because he was God moving toward us. He is God desiring us. He is God in communion with us. And that desire led Jesus ultimately to the cross. But the night before he died, what did he do? He gave us a meal. He gave us a meal of bread and wine. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. What is he saying? He's saying, I am the life giving communion with God for you. I am God moving towards you. I am God desiring you. And it is only as we receive that movement, it is only as we receive God's desire and love for us in Jesus. It is only as we live in his 
presence, live receiving the work that he has done for us. It is only then that our desires will be changed. We will move towards God when we realize and receive that he has moved towards us and his son. People who treat addicts know how important relationships are for recovery from addiction. AA is built on that principle that the bonds of relational connection help break the bondage of an addiction. And I once heard an expert say, it doesn't do any good to yell at addicts and tell them how terrible they are. He said, no, we need to sing love songs to them instead. Love songs that invite them out of their destructive habits, their destructive attachments, and into healthy, transformative connection. That's what God has done for us. We're all addicts, stumbling towards the house of God. And in his son and spirit, he sings to us a love song. A love song that irresistibly draws us out of that house of death. It brings us into the house of life. It brings us into life-giving communion with him. See, Jesus He's like those red flowers that bloomed outside of the kitchen. He is the beauty that should attract us, creatures in motion. So this week, did you feel that pull away from God? Did you feel that pull away from the life that he calls you to. Hear him singing to you. Fly to the beauty of Jesus. Taste and see the Lord is good. Let's pray. Father, would you help us You know how confused, how misdirected our desires are. You know the depth of that magnetic pull that sin and folly has on us. We cry out and say, we're helpless without you. Maybe we know what we should desire and why we should desire it. But we are helpless unless you move towards us, unless you desire us. So Father, would you sing to us? Would you put in front of our eyes the beauty of Jesus, the beauty of what you have done? Would you interrupt our confusion Would you interrupt those steps that are taking us in the direction of death and turn us by your power and beauty? Lead <coughs> us in the life giving communion. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.